This is a true story. There was a time that we had run out of money, like for real run out of money. But we had done an investment, a property investment here. And I remember that day, I didn't have any money to feed my children. And I said to my ex, we need to get some money because I have nothing right now. I'm not going to ask anybody. That's too embarrassing. I'm not going to do it. It's like, what are we going to do? It's like, I don't know. I was forced to go and uh, I remember at the time, I hadn't given, I was heavily pregnant with baby number four. I was forced to go and ask one of his business partners for money. I remember um, he drove me to the mall and he's, cause that's where I was supposed to meet the person. He said, you get out and go and get the money cause I'm not going to do it. I remember walking through a crumble mall to go and get this money. And I wanted to cry as I was doing the journey. <sighs> he got me crying on camera. <laughs> I remember crying or wanting to cry because my back was hurting, I was tired. I was, I was like, oh, I must have been about seven or eight months pregnant. You're really taking me back now. <laughs> I'm even feeling emotional. <laughs> I just felt like I needed my own space. Mm. I moved into what we call in, in the UK a hostel. And that was really, that was a really hard time for me because I didn't know what the outside world was like. I felt, I feel like my life was somehow shielded and so, oh gosh, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> I feel like my life was, okay, give me a second. It's okay. Woo. I remember one day she attacked me and she just started fighting me. And this was, it was really tough for me because I didn't really have, I didn't really know what to do. I didn't expect someone to behave. I've not seen behavior like that before. Somehow found guys easier to mm. deal with. Because I was so innocent, I found women really hard and I was so, I was so insecure about myself. Okay, so this was like one of the dumbest things I did. I'm gonna say it on camera anyway. You, you gave me to open up about stuff I've never talked about, you know, honestly. It's good. <laughs> you got the knack, I'll tell you that. They wanted to explore with me more. Mm. I'm not that girl. Mm. But one day, I think I just had hit such a low point in my life that I was like, let me just, let me try. No, pause that. You hit a low point in your life. Mm. What happened? Loneliness. There's a little bit of a disconnect. Our parents are not that open with us. Your mom never called you pretty. Not that I can recall. Although I look okay on the outside, I'm not really okay inside. But one thing the UK does is it keeps you busy. You don't have time to assess and think, is this right, is this not right? You're just in life, right? You, you keep going, it's fast paced. You don't have time to stop and reflect on anything. I was just like, I'm married now. And for me, once I got married, I'm married. I'm not thinking about divorce or separate. No, 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 you've done the deal, you've signed. It's done. It's forever. I think Ghana has a way of bringing out everything that is not okay. There are three things when it comes to failed marriages, right? Sex, finance, communication. Ours was finance. Mm. I was feeling the burden of that and I was becoming really run down and tired. I was exhausted. It showed in everything about me. I couldn't hide it. And I just, I wasn't a person anymore. Mm. Hmm. That's the only way that I can what describe do you mean by it. That? One day we had an argument about what he was doing. And he said to me, well, when you were having children, wasn't I the one working? Wasn't I the one making all the money? It's, I want to rest now. I haven't failed. I tried for so long. Because people ask me, if it was so bad, why didn't you leave so long ago? You could have left at any moment. Because I kept trying. I kept trying and trying and trying and I was hitting my head against a wall. Mm. And it wasn't going to change. This is a huge problem. This is not a Della issue. This is a huge problem, especially within the African community, where things are happening and we're not, talk we're not talking about them because of how people are gonna respond to the things that we're saying and how we're gonna be looked at. I've spent many nights going to bed crying. Mm -hmm. I don't want someone else to feel like that, feel like they're alone. Mm and that's how that was birthed. Mm. I think going back mm. to 24, I would not have got married. If you knew me in the UK, you don't know me now. You don't know me. Trust that. Hello guys and welcome back again to another amazing episode. And as you guys already know, 
is a diaspora transition episode. Today is quite different. You know, we've interviewed a lot of diasporans relocated from the US, UK, moving onto the continent over the years. Today we do have here someone special. She decided to relocate from the UK to Ghana with her then husband and uh, kids, you know, moved down here to Ghana. But something happened. Their relationship went into shambles, you know. Um, attitude and characters begin to, you know, come out of, you know, either parties that, you know, resulted in a divorce. Uh, today she's here to be able to, you know, tell the story of, of how it happens. And most of you guys know that it's, it's happened. Most people come to Ghana and their marriages, you know, they get separated. I know at, at least two to three people that happened to. I want to ask her why did that happen and why that is becoming a trend. And how did she, I mean, she wrote a book, you know, saying that 18 years of her life was, you know, basically taken away from her because she went into marriage that she was not supposed to in the first place. So we do have here, Mal Tudela, used to be called Natural Ghana Girl. So without <laughs> further ado, welcome on the show. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah? Yeah. Now, I want to do it just like the journalist I was telling, why did you divorce? <laughs> <laughs> Straight to it. Yeah. People are watching you. Um, you've been to Ghana. You know, you've moved here for almost 10 years now. Yes, 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen your YouTube videos. If someone is watching you, they've never seen you before, they've known who you are, mm -hmm. briefly introduce yourself uh, to the people watching. Okay. So I am Motudela, formerly, as you said, um, natural Ghana girl. I came to Ghana 10 years ago as a whole family unit. So my then partner, <coughs> I have to use using the word husband, <coughs> it makes me choke. But yeah, my then husband and I had three children at the time. I had a fourth one while I was here. And we basically pretty much had a journey of what it was like to transition from the UK to Ghana and we I started a YouTube channel and it kind of followed my journey and what the building process was like in building a, a house for our family and it's been a journey ever since so that's pretty much what the YouTube was about mm. but I'm, I do a lot more than that though yeah mm -hmm. you do um, let's go back to the beginning of it all yeah um, were you born in the UK yes I was both my parents are Ghanaian though okay Take me there. Take you back to the past. Who are your parents? Where did mm -hmm. they move from? Mm -hmm. um, but being born in the UK, you, you growing up. Yeah. To the point of even you meeting your um, so then <laughs> partner, uh, yes. husband. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah, both my parents are Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. They were born in Ghana and moved to the UK. I think my mom was in her early 20s when they moved. They moved and decided to start a life in the UK. Mm. Obviously very foreign, you know, when you come from Ghana, it's a totally different world going to the UK. And then a few years later, she gave birth to me. Um, I have two brothers who are younger than me. Mm. I think I was the first one to sort of have an interest in Ghana in terms of moving here. After my parents had moved to the UK, we used to do family holidays in Ghana. So every school holiday, every other year, we'd be coming to Ghana. So I had an idea of what Ghana was. Ghana was never 100% new to me. Um, I didn't really enjoy Ghana at that time mm -hmm. because any time I'd come to Ghana, I would always fall sick my first few How days. old were you the first time you came to Ghana? Oh gosh, I must have been a baby, I'm sure. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't even know, but pretty young. It's, I don't know any other holiday destination outside of Ghana because Ghana was the only place that we ever went to as a family. Um, and I think that was just because it was nice for my parents to reconnect after having been in the UK for so long and being, having to be ingrained into that culture. I think it was nice for them to come out of that and really embrace the culture in Ghana again. So I think for them it was just a really nice thing to, mm -hmm. to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your, your parents, what were they doing for work in the UK? Mm. So my dad was an engineer mm -hmm. and my mom was, she was an office worker. Okay. Yeah, so that's kind of how they did it. It's really funny. I remember my mom told me this story once. Um, I don't know if she will allow me to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. She said that when she was in the UK, you know in Ghana when it rains, yeah. Everything stops, right? Yeah. People don't turn up to work, you know, all kinds of things happen. So when she was in the UK, she had this job and it rained one day, so she didn't go to work. And then they sacked her because <laughs> she was actually didn't turn up at work. But it's a cultural thing here to, you know, it rains, you can't go to work. So she adopted the same attitude 
in the UK and then she was sacked for it because but she didn't know any different and sometimes there are these culture differences that we don't know that we have to embrace and I think having come from Ghana and going to the UK it's a whole world that you have to you have to re-explore you know oftentimes we think of what it's like moving from the UK to Ghana and having to immerse ourselves in the Ghana culture but for those of our parents that were from here and had to go to the UK they had to do the same thing and try and understand what the culture is like over there. So I think that was a huge shock for her to see that something like that could happen. But mm. I mean, interesting. It was, so it was fun. They, they got married in Ghana before going to the UK. Yeah. Okay. Did you grow up with them throughout or the, mm -hmm. the so how yeah. was that? I, yeah, I grew up with both my parents. So that's what I knew. Mom, dad in a, in a household. But then my dad left and came back to Ghana when I was around 14 or so. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really difficult for me because I was very close to my dad and so it felt like a huge loss when he went away and we had to almost start over, that's what it felt like. So that was hard and obviously that, comparing that to my situation now, mm -hmm. obviously there are some, there's some connection there. There are some things I understand and some things that I'm now looking back at, I'm like, okay, this is why it was like that. You know, mm -hmm. but my parents hadn't split when my dad moved to Ghana. That's I need to be clear on that. There was no split. They were still married. The plan was that we were all supposed to come as a family, move to Ghana, and I was supposed to go to school here. So my dad had already picked out a school for me here and everything, but it just didn't happen that way. Plans Why? fell apart. Why did your mom say no to moving with your dad to Ghana? I think the upheaval, and I think she just perhaps wanted to do a bit more in the UK. Mm. I think for that, that generation, I think having left a Ghana that they had seen here, which was quite hard, and then moving back to the, to, moving to the UK and having a, some type of sense of freedom, and then thinking about coming back, I think it was probably quite scary because you think that you're gonna walk back into that exact same situation. Because even for me who moved to Ghana 10 years ago, there were some things which were a shock to my system that I wasn't aware of. So I can, imagine, I can only imagine what it would have been like for her to have moved back after being so used to being in the UK now, to have to come back to Ghana where things are not as developed. That probably was quite frightening. So mm. on that level, I do understand it. But yeah, so plans changed and it just, it just didn't happen. So I felt like I lost my dad for a number of years, you know. Mm. What year did he move to Ghana? Whilst you were in the I'm UK. not sure of the year. I was like 14, so I don't know. I'm not sure of the year. You were like 14 years old? I was old. about 14. Okay. Yeah. When you moved to Ghana permanently? Yeah, he moved here. He was here for about six years, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're 14 years old. Your dad moved to Ghana. You still mm -hmm. live with your mom yeah. in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, were you in school at that time? What were you doing? Yeah, I was in school. Um, I was just in, I was in secondary school. Mm -hmm. So that was very hard for me because academically, my dad was always the one to sort of push me. Remember back then I wanted to be an accountant and he used to, we used to do this thing on Saturdays, he would buy me this maths book and I love maths so much. Mm. And I would just do all the questions in the book and then I'd get to the end, he would check them, he'd mark them off for me and then I'd go and I'd rub them all out and I'd start again because I love maths so much. And so that was our thing. So we had this real closeness and then when he left, that's, that all stopped because my mum was busy. She had to work, she had to look after the three of us. And so it was a different fi family dynamic. So that was very difficult for me to kind of get used to. But I mean, you have to, whatever your situation is, you have to adapt to it, right? Mm. But it was just a different way of doing life mm. and I, I hadn't foreseen that. Mm. Yeah. So 14, growing up, finishing high school then? Yeah. I'm um, going to university. Mm. Um, how was it like, you know, going to the university? What was the dynamic like for you? Because then you are 14 now, you're probably 18 by then, yeah. you're of age, mm -hmm. and in university, you're seeing men, like, really walk me through your, you growing up, living with a single mom by, by that time, not yeah. because your daddy was not in the picture, mm. but he's out of the country, and having to, you know, yeah. walk me through You're that. really taking me back now, <laughs> I'm feeling emotional. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I think... Um, I became very independent in mm -hmm. some ways. So I moved out of home when I was 18. Mm -hmm. I just felt like I needed my own space. Mm -hmm. And that was a journey by itself because I moved into what we call in, in the UK a hostel. And that was really, that was a really hard time for me because I was so innocent and so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And um, going into that phase of my life was just really hard. I was what facing a lot of things. What made you vulnerable? 
I didn't know what the outside world was like. I felt, I feel like my life was somehow shielded in some, oh my gosh, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> I feel like my life was, okay, give me a second. It's okay. Woo. I always knew this was going to be a really good interview with you. <laughs> yeah, my life was somehow shielded in some ways. And when I went into that hustle, it was a rude awakening for me mm. because I think because my dad wasn't around, so in some ways my protector wasn't there. And I was being forced into this situation. I wasn't forced into I went into this situation because I wanted my independence. And so it was very hard for me to adapt to the outside world. And I didn't know people were so mean. <laughs> I'm like, I'm such a genuinely nice person. And then I came across people who were mean. Mm -hmm. So I was having to share, I remember I shared this um, apartment with this girl and she was, she was horrible. It's like, she used to use my stuff in the kitchen. And one day I approached her, I was like, why are you using my items? Like I'm buying this stuff, this shopping. And I remember one day she attacked me and she just started fighting me. Mm -hmm. And this was, it was really tough for me because I didn't really have, I didn't really know what to do. I didn't expect someone to behave. I've not seen behavior like that before. Growing up in an African household, you don't, you don't fight, right? You can have an argument, but you don't fight. And this girl, she was fight, she wants to fight me. And I, I didn't understand what I deserved, what, what I'd done to deserve for her to fight me, you know? And so that was new for me. But I think this is really when my relationships with guys really was really formed because then at that time I found that I gravitated to guys a lot. So a lot of my friends, even right up until today, all the friends I have So your are first guys. year, was that first year? Yeah, so I got my apartment when I just turned, when I was about 19, maybe going into 20. So I was in a hostel for about two years. Okay. Yeah, so I moved out of home when I was 18, and then I was in the hostel for about two years until I got my apartment. So I think during those two years was when I really got to have really strong friendships with guys. Hmm. Because the women were very hostile towards I found, you. I wouldn't even say they were hostile. I just somehow found guys easier to mm. deal with. Because I was so innocent, I found women really hard. And I was so, I was so insecure about myself. So for me, I didn't, I didn't think that I was pretty. Mm. I felt like I was too scared. I had a lot of insecurity mm. issues back mm. then. And I don't think people believed that I had those issues. And so people were seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself. So I think people thought that, oh, this girl's really pretty. She's got it all. She's got it made. But I didn't. I was literally holding on by a thread. I didn't have that. And so for me, having relationship with other female girls was sometimes there would be maybe jealousy or things like that. It was hard for me. It was hard for me to overcome that. And so I just stayed away from girls because it was just, I just didn't want to deal with, I didn't like drama and I didn't want what to deal with What level were you in the university at this time? Oh gosh, university, I started university. I didn't even finish properly. I just, I, I, I dropped out. I dropped out. I, was, I went into university. I had my apartment by that time. I studied, I started studying psychology and sociology because I wanted to be a social worker, because I have a heart for people because I'm an empath. Um, I, didn't, I didn't even finish, mm. I didn't finish. I because of how you were being treated, you felt like, you know, was that some of the I think contributing factor? Partly, I think I felt like I didn't really have a support system and I couldn't focus, I couldn't focus academically. I think I needed my dad for that I and mean, he wasn't here for that really um and it just felt it felt like it just felt everything just fell apart i think i was maybe starting to try to discover who i was as a person i don't think i ever quite got there i just i fell into the lap of people who would always try and steer me in a direction of who they thought that i should be and it never really worked out well uh, yeah. So in 19 years, you've moved out of your, your mom's home. Mm. You're having your own apartment. Yeah. You dropped out of school. What was next for you at that time? I was just working. Just what were you doing for work? So um, I was in university at that time. And then I was working part time too. I remember I was working at Churchill's car insurance. So I was making money from sales and, you know, I was getting a salary as well. 
So that, that was good. It felt nice to make my own money and it felt nice to have my own space, my own apartment. But there was definitely a loneliness there, I would say, definitely. Um, at this point, I then had some more stable guy friends around me, so they kind of kept me company. And I have to say, it was platonic, <laughs> before anyone jumps to conclusion. I was very, I was never out there in the streets like that. Those that know me, I was, I've never been like a street girl. I'm, hey, I'm very innocent. Even people that know me now, like I have this one friend, we're very, we're like this, we're really, really close. And he says to me, man, you're really innocent, you know. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I am. Like, I, I don't know a whole lot. Like, when it comes to, like, relationships and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're 19 years old. You moved out of your, your parents' apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, you started working. You have more male friends now. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was your community like? Were you going to church? Really walk me through this. Yeah, so the church definitely happened. But just before I, before I got to the church stage, mm -hmm. I'd say I had my first boyfriend when I was 18 years old. It wasn't really anything serious. He was my boyfriend. That was my first experience, really. Um, I don't really know what I expected from a relationship with him, but he was very work focused. He was Nigerian, actually. <laughs> he was very work focused, and so anytime we were together, he would always have his books and he'd be studying. I couldn't understand it. I was like, really? this guy's forever studying. Ah, Nigerians always studying. I don't understand. Like, I, at that stage, I think I wanted to have a fun, I wanted to go out and, you know, I wanted to maybe go to a couple of parties, house parties and things like that. I was trying to, I was trying to understand me, you know. One thing I did realise is I didn't like drinking though. Alcohol was never for me, so I never really did the whole alcohol partying thing. I just wanted to be myself, you know. So yeah, we dated for, I can't remember how long we dated for. I don't think it was very long. We dated and then we broke up. Um, and then, after I got my apartment, then I had my next boyfriend. So I was about 19, 20. I had my first boy, my second boyfriend. Again, nothing very serious. Um, what is the details of dating? In Ghana, when someone says I'm dating somebody, mm. it's like boyfriend and girlfriend. Yes. And I realized that in the West, when someone says I'm dating, it means they go on, on a lunch, <laughs> they eat together and they talk about themselves. Yeah. And that's it. Um, yeah. So when you say dating um, your second boyfriend mm. after you go to your apartment, what does that mean exactly? So I wouldn't, we never went out on a date, I have to be clear. We never dated, never went, took me to restaurants and stuff like that. He liked me, I liked him. Let's be boyfriend and girlfriend, like that. So then we used to just hang out. You know, he'd come to my place or I'd go to his place. And that was it, it was nothing. I don't even, I don't even know what dating even really meant, you know. I was just with this person, we just, we were attracted to each other. And that's what my dating experience was like. So I think we dated probably for about a year. And then it ended, and then I started dating somebody else. That was my third boyfriend. How did it end? How did it end? Um, you know, I can't really remember. It wasn't really something that was ever serious to me like that. So I didn't, I don't really, I can't really remember mm. how it ended. I don't know. Mm. I think perhaps maybe I did probably want a little bit more. I didn't, I didn't know. And I think at that age, you know, when you're, your early years, guys almost want to take a little bit of advantage of you. Elaborate on that. They want to see how much they can explore with you, you know. Mm. And that's not really a road that I wanted to go down. Like I said, I can't remember the reason that we broke up, but we broke up. And then I, I had my boyfriend number three. I only had three boyfriends before I got married. Let's talk about boyfriend number three. <laughs> How did you guys meet? How was it like? Okay, so this was like one of the dumbest things I did. I'm going to say it on camera anyway. So he was friends with the boyfriend number two. I know. The worst was never, never do that. Please never do that. Yeah, so I then started dating this other guy. And I think it was cool at first. But then things were going really... You, you're getting me to open up about stuff I've never talked about, you know, honestly. It's good. <laughs> you got the knack, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I think at that stage, as we were getting... It was, things were fine at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think as we were getting more into the relationship, they wanted to explore with me more. Mm. I'm not that girl. Mm. 
I'm a good girl. Explore. Elaborate on the explore. What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, they wanted to do things together with me. Mm. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not that girl. I'm such a, I like to say good girl. That's not my path to do that. Hey, if that works for you, by all means, I'm not that type of girl. And so I think that relationship ended quite quickly because I realized that this, was, this isn't something serious and I don't want to be that type of girl. Although I struggled with my identity and who I was and my self-worth, I knew that I couldn't be that. And I didn't, I didn't want that. Mm. And so quickly that third relationship ended. And then also I was then being introduced to church. Mm. And when I was in church, I was very much... Who was introducing you to church? So I had a friend that I was, I had a friend and she wanted me to come to church. And she kept on asking me, let's go to church, let's go to church. And I was like, church, my experience of church was my parents dragging me into this Catholic church. And it's one hour and it's like, my goodness, this is not over yet. You know, and it was really boring. And so when you mention church to me, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. But one day, I think I just had hit such a low point in my life that I was like, let me just, let me try. Let's see what it's like. Mm. And so I went to church and I loved it. Mm. Now, Pastor, you hit a low point in your life. Mm. What, what happened? Loneliness. Mm. I felt really alone. Mm. So I would say my relationship with my mum was not on a hundred just because I think sometimes females in a house there can be a bit of friction and I would say that and this is not just for me I think with all African parents sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect our parents are not that open with us and sometimes I think more so for girls it can be a struggle mm -hmm. so I didn't have this open relationship where I could go to my mum for, for things, you know. I probably, if my dad had been around, I probably would have had more of that with him than I had with my mum. Mm. And that's not a reflection on my mum. I just want to make that clear. I think because I was in a space where I was trying to find myself, mm. um, it was difficult. It was difficult. Probably she hadn't had that experience. And so she didn't know how to give me that experience. And so there was just something missing. So even though you were lonely, you couldn't go to your mom to talk to her? Not about deep stuff, no. My mom, always want, my mom always wanted me to come back home. She would always tell me, come back home. But I needed to be outside for mm. myself to grow. Yeah. You meant something, you said something about being insecure. And we, we know that this happened in the beginning of our life as children. Whatever we are in the adult age is because it happened in our childhood. What made you insecure in your own household? What do you think were the, some of the contributing factor to you being insecure in yourself, even though everybody else around you then was telling you how pretty you are? Was this some you know, thing you said by your parents mm -hmm. um, without throwing any shade, obviously, but share with us your experience yeah. growing up. What are some of the things dropped into your mind at, you know, during childhood that made you feel you know, mm. not pretty? Yeah. I don't think anybody really called me pretty growing up. Um, I think the thing that I was known for is having long hair. People would always compliment me, oh, your hair's so long. That's the one thing that I had. But uh, pretty? No, I don't really recall that kind of thing. Your mom never called you pretty? Not that I can recall. And I think that um, people would often tell me like, that I was skinny. Oh, I, it, my dad is very small. Well, he was, he's past now. My dad was always very small framed, and I take after my dad. I'm also very small framed. I can't put on weight, I just don't put on weight. Never, never, it's never happened. And so I think I just had that insecurity and going through life and people always pointing out the fact that you're, you're skinny, you're, just, you're too skinny. And so it kind of went with me and I carried that through my life. And so because of that, I don't know, maybe I just associated that with not being pretty. It was, just, it was just like that. And so my standards for myself were very low. Mm. So church was introduced, mm. you know, started going to church. 
Mm -hmm. um, how was the community like? Did you become very happy? You felt like you were not lonely it was, anymore? It was wonderful. Mm. It was so good. It was exactly what I needed. It felt like I was really part of something. It was a community and I, I absolutely loved it. I was dedicated. I went to church every Sunday I was there. Mm. I got so into it. I, at one point I was even leading in worship at church because I really, I really, really, really You're enjoyed it. You were in the choir? It. Yeah. I love to sing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I was in there. Um, I think the thing about church, though, was that they encouraged me to almost somehow disconnect from the guy friends that I had made, my friendships there. And I think mm -hmm. that was because it was assumed that if you had guy friends, it meant that you were doing stuff with them. And I think that at that point, I still was on boyfriend number three when I was in church. And so I was very gently being coerced away from that. And in some ways, I did also accept it as well because I thought, I kind of knew that my relationship number three wasn't a great one. And I knew that I had to sort of break that off. And I think going into church allowed me to have the strength to break that off and say, okay, I'm done with that. And actually walking away for real. So it helped me with that. But then I lost all my other guy friends too. Even the ones that we were just friends, I lost all of them along the way. And then I was in church and everything I did was about church. And that was my life. But the good thing that church did for me was that I began to get a little bit of self-worth. I began to think that I was somebody, mm. you know? Mm. It was kind of like that. So church was good for that. Mm. But there is something I would say about church that was not good. Mm. And this isn't necessarily a reflection on the church that I went to. I think African churches in general, they want to put you on that train of start thinking about marriage, start thinking about having children, stop. And I was on that trajectory. And that's what happened. It's almost, I felt like there was this pressure to marry me off so that I wouldn't be doing stuff outside of church. I wouldn't mm. be sleeping with guys outside of church. And that's the road that I was put on. I remember my self-worth was not great. So I just, when I got into church and that sort of thing started happening, you know, I wasn't encouraged to date lots of people in church, see what you like, see what you don't. I wasn't encouraged, because my three boyfriends before, like, it wasn't serious. I knew it was never gonna, I was never gonna marry any of them. It was, not, it was just a fun thing. But being in church was different. This was about getting married, being in a long-term relationship. And so that's where I went. And because I was never encouraged to see what you like, first person that came along, okay. Hmm. So they received you very well, helped you with your self-worth, mm -hmm. um, leading choir, singing, being church, being at church every time, devoting your time. Now they want to now get you married. And then your then husband um, popped into the picture. What was that conversation like when he popped into that picture? I think we were just very good friends. Like I said, because all my friends had been guys, it was easy for me to just be friends. Like pick any guy, I can just, just like that. I just. I don't know. It's just something that I have. I can just be friends with guys. And I think that's how it was with him. We were just able to be friends. So we would talk a lot and it just developed, but it developed too fast. Mm. We dated, I do this in quotation marks because we didn't actually go out on a date. We hung out a lot for a year and a half before we were married. Mm. For me, that was way too soon. I didn't mm. know who I was. Mm. We were married. You didn't know who we were? No. Hmm. I, hadn't ex I, hadn't, I hadn't explored myself. I, hadn't, I didn't know what I wanted for my future, really. I knew I wanted to be a wife and a mother, but I didn't know my future, what my future was going to look like. I hadn't had time to dream about it. I hadn't thought about traveling. I hadn't thought about doing those things. Hmm. I, I wasn't there yet. Hmm. So what were your mom saying at that time, even when you, you were dating um, your then husband? Mm -hmm. What was your dad saying? What was a church pastor saying at that time? Mm -hmm. And who was doing a lot of the pushing, trying to get you together? Um, my dad was kind of like, he'd been back a bit and then left. So he was now kind of in and out from the UK and Ghana. So 
And I remember he'd missed a chunk of my life now, right? Uh, an important part of my life, so. Since 14 years old. Yeah, so we weren't as close. Mm. He was there, but we, there was something missing, so I couldn't just now start to unburden to him and start telling him all this stuff. That relationship was not the same. My mom, again, it had just been like that throughout. I felt like my mom was busy. That's how I felt. I, that doesn't mean it was a reality. That's how I felt. And again, we hadn't had an open relationship to talk about these things. And I felt like I was okay at the time. Mm -hmm. At the time, I thought, I'm good. I Just mm -hmm. in church, I've got these wonderful people around me. And I thought that I was okay. I didn't know that there was anything wrong with me, you know. And I think um, I had this one pastor who was like a dad to me. He was amazing. He was amazing to me. He really filled a gap for me. He made me believe in myself, you know. And I, I, I trusted him for direction. And I, he didn't disappoint me. He never disappointed me at all. But I think that someone can tell you all the things that this is what you should do, this is what you should be looking towards. And because you tr have so much trust in that person, you go with it, you know? He never did, I'm trying to be careful with my words because he never, he never did me dirty. He wanted the best for me and he really did. The pastor really wanted the best for you, right? Mm. What were you feeling at that time, you know, in your mind? Um... I think that when I came into church initially, mm -hmm. he knew, I was all smiles, mm -hmm. but he knew I wasn't okay, right? And him and his wife really took me under their wing. They really, like, I became really close with their family. Like, I used to look after their, their two-year-old son at the time. I used to babysit him. And I felt like he picked, almost picked up the relationship that I had with my dad. Mm -hmm. He picked up from there. And he protected me like that in some ways. And he would, you know, sometimes I remember he would really look into me. When he asked me, he would really look right into me. And he would get things out of me that I didn't even admit to myself yet, you know. And he was bringing out things in me that I didn't even know were there. So I think he made me believe that I was special in some ways. That, but you're, you're a very intelligent girl. You're very smart. Like he was telling me, he was affirming things for me that I needed to have affirmed in me for me to be able to go out in the world and be okay. He was giving me that fatherly role that I hadn't had. And that was great. That was really, really nice. And I needed that. So that was wonderful. But the next step was always relationship. It was always that. I wasn't ready. Maybe he didn't know that I wasn't ready because I buried a lot of stuff because I think I was just, I realized that I'm a loner. I'm somebody who just, I can do life by myself. I've always been that, I've been that way from before I even left home. Always in my room. I watch TV, I listen to music, I write. That was my thing. I was always, I was, I was happy. I've always been happy being by myself, so it wasn't an issue. But maybe that part of me, he hadn't really explored to know that side of me that, although I look okay on the outside, I'm not really okay inside, mm. you know. So mm. me joining to someone else, Mm. wasn't the so time. that pastor um who filled a gap of your dad was the one who would, you would say almost got you to get married to your then husband yeah i mean he encouraged it definitely because he was like this is beautiful and on the surface it was beautiful and it could have been beautiful if i was whole mm -hmm. i wasn't a whole there were too many things you know and I'm, I don't want it to come across like I'm saying that he did something wrong because he didn't. He did everything right. He was great. He passed away like maybe about three to four years now and that crushed me. That mm. really did. But he was, he was great. Him and his wife, absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful. I cannot fault them, honestly. Mm -hmm. They definitely helped me in life. But internally, I had things that I needed to work through that no one knew about. Mm. So you got married? Mm. How was it? Who was there? 
I was great at first. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was great. Oh, we had a lot of fun, you know, like, mm -hmm. I like to laugh. Hey, like I said, guys, we're, we're going to get into it. We're going to laugh all day. We're going to have one joke, all of it. So it was great. It was great. Your parents were there? My dad, yeah, my dad had just sort of started coming back. Um, he never really had an opinion on who I'd picked as a partner, per se. I think because he was maybe still trying to now re-get to know me, because he doesn't know me anymore, right? I've changed, he's changed. And so he didn't really speak on that so much. And perhaps he didn't really know him as much. I was just, and I'm, <laughs> my brothers say that I'm stubborn. <laughs> And so I think even if someone had tried to tell me, oh, why don't you wait a bit? I'm probably too stubborn to really take that on board, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. My mum was very relaxed about it. That's what you want to do? Okay, fine. So both of them were there at the wedding? Yeah. Okay, was it a white wedding or a traditional wedding? White wedding. White wedding. So it was in church. Yeah. Everybody was there. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. What was the counseling process like when you took your husband together to see the pastor at mm -hmm. that time? What did he say about your husband then? Um, counseling, I think church counseling is never deep enough. I don't think it really goes into the depth of what you need before you get married. I think it's more scratches the surface level of things. So in counseling, we would talk about things like um, you know, how you want to raise your children, um, you know, the things that you want to do together with your, with your partner. I don't think it was, it was deep enough. It didn't really, and I think that's more to do with therapy. Mm -hmm. I think counselling, church counselling and therapy are two different things. And I think at that stage we needed therapy rather than church counselling. Church counselling is too basic. You know, I remember we were supposed to, we wanted to have a budget friendly wedding and there was, and so we had agreed in one of the counseling sessions that we wouldn't spend. Mm. I, mean, I like clothes or so I'll go shopping. So that we had agreed that we weren't going to spend anything. And I remember I went to buy this frying pan. And then my ex brought it up in a counseling session. Look, she's spending, she bought a frying pan. And I remember the pastor at the time, he was like, it's a frying pan. It, she needed a frying pan. The one she has is broken. Like, it's not a big thing. And it wasn't really a big thing. But you know, hindsight is always something it's wonderful hindsight, right? But the fact that he was pointing out and he was so angry that I bought this frying pan, to me, I didn't understand. And maybe it meant more than the frying pan later on when I look at it. It was more than the fact that I bought it. There was something else there that I hadn't seen. And I think when it comes to small things like that, those are the things that need to be probed more. Like, why are you upset that I, have a frying, that I bought a frying pan? You know, there was like little things like this along the way that really should have delved deeper into it and it, ne it never was. Hmm. So married, living together. We got, yeah, we lived together after we got married because you know, you're not supposed to have sex. Mm -hmm. hmm? <laughs> you're not supposed to have sex when you're in church, right, before you get married. Right. You're supposed to keep it clean. Okay. But were you guys, <laughs> were you guys keeping it clean? Uh, for the most part, yes. For the most part. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We fell once and we did. And I remember when it happened, I remember he went and told, I was like, what did you tell for? <laughs> he went and told. And so we had actually planned to court for a certain period of time and then get married. But because now we had slept together, now the pastors knew that we had slept together. They were like, let's bring forward the marriage day. So then we ended up getting married earlier. Hmm. Because I guess these guys are going to do this again. Let's get them married. Hmm. So we got married earlier. Hmm. So living together, working. What was he doing for work? What were you doing for work? Mm -hmm. um, walk me through how that moment was, newly wedded. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I think at that time when I got married, I was still... No, I'd just gone into... I think I'd gone into full-time work. I was working full-time now because I had dropped out of university um i was doing some office job or mm. something like that and 
I don't want to go too much into it because there's a story there which you'll see in the book that I wrote. Mm. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. But yeah, I was doing in like an office role and he was, what was he doing at the time? He was working, he was working at one of these retail department stores full time. We weren't, neither of us was really doing anything like really serious job wise. We didn't have career on our minds at that point. We're still young. I was 24. He was 23. You know, so that wasn't really a thing yet. We hadn't really worked out life yet. But um, yeah, we were living together. We were living in my apartment. I had a one bedroom apartment, apartment that I had gone through the hostel to get. We were living there together. And it was fine. It was fun, I would say. It was regular life. There was nothing. We just got into regular life. There was nothing special, I would say. Mm. That was really so happening. So at what age do you have your first child with him? I had my first child when I was 29. 29. Okay. Almost 30 years old. Yeah. I see. So talk me through this process. Mm. At what point did Ghana begin to even come into your picture, your mind, while still having children and living life? Mm. At what point did you feel, I mean, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So in 2007, my mum wanted us all to come to Ghana as a family, like all of us, Your his mom? family, my mum wanted to, yeah, just like a big family holiday. Mm -hmm. So we had planned towards this thing. So in 2007, we all came to Ghana and my ex at the time, he, were, he left Ghana when he was six and he had never been back. So when he came to Ghana, his eyes were lit up like, I can't believe this is Ghana. He was like, he was so in love with the place. Me, I was like, Psh. I didn't really care. I'd been here so many times. It wasn't anything for me. But since coming back from that trip, Ghana was just on his mind. He just wanted to move to Ghana and he would talk about it so much. I was like, I'm not coming to Ghana, I haven't had my children yet. So that for me was off the table. Like I wasn't even gonna, I wasn't even gonna try it. And you were 29 years old? I was, yeah, 29. So yeah, I was 29, 30, going into my 30s. So I had a child every two years. <laughs> so yeah, I had a child every two years. And I think when I got to baby number three, I felt like I was finished having children and he still had the whole thing of wanting to come to Ghana. So I was like, okay, let's try it. And things were getting hard in the UK too. I didn't like going to work. I'm not a nine to five. I didn't understand why. I understand now. I'm not a nine to five. I, it's not for me. And so I was fed up and obviously coming out of those maternity years now I've had my baby number three I'm gonna have to go back to work I really didn't want to go back to work so I was like hey yeah let's try Ghana so then we moved to Ghana we moved to Ghana in 2014 mm. before you moved to Ghana was there any red flag you spotted in the relationship then um, before you guys decided to move to Ghana I would say there are probably a few little things mm. but one thing the UK does is it keeps you busy you don't have time to assess and think, is this right, is this not right? You're just in life, right? You, you keep going. It, it's fast paced. You don't have time to stop and reflect on anything. So I think there were a few things that I was unhappy about, but I never really dwelled on it to really think about what those things were and really analyze them. I was just like, I'm married now. And for me, once I got married, I'm married. I'm not thinking about divorce or separate. No, 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 you've done the deal, you've signed. It's done. It's forever. Mm. So that's where my thought was. I never really wanted to focus on things that were not right because I was just like, I'm in this. And so I never focused on anything. It was when we came to Ghana, mm. which is where the issues really came out. Now you're yeah, relaxed. You have time to think. You're not on the right uh, wheels. Mm -hmm. you know? So you started spotting the red flag that was brushed under the carpet whilst in the UK. Mm -hmm. hmm, interesting. Yeah. I think Ghana has a way of bringing out everything that is not okay. Mm. You have, it's, it's a slower pace. You have time to think. And so you'll notice things that you never had time to notice before. Mm. Mm. But there must be a big shift that happened that made you think that, listen, we must bring an end uh, to this relationship. What was that? I think I said this in the interview that I did with Derek. Mm. There are three things when it comes to failed marriages, right? Sex, finance, communication. Ours was finance. Mm. 
finance was a huge problem. And I think I felt that I was always the one who was having to make it work somehow. Mm. And I just got Because to... even when you got married, you lived in your apartment. Mm. It wasn't his house. It wasn't his apartment. It was yours. Yeah. So... So coming to Ghana, we stayed at my dad's first when we first came. And then we rented somewhere together. And then as things got tough financially again, we moved into my dad's place again. And I just felt like, I started to feel like, what are you doing? Because I felt like I was always the one having to push and make things work. So remember when I said earlier that I can't, I found it hard to have a nine to five. I didn't realize it was because I was entrepreneurial, right? So there was things that, I was starting to do in the UK that would generate little bits of money here and there. But it, it manifested more when I came to Ghana because when you're backed into a corner, right, you have to come out fighting. And so every time we were backed into a financial corner, I would come out fighting. I'm like, I'm going to do this, this and this to make some money. And I couldn't really see what was happening with him, where, like, there was like, no... Like, what is he doing to help the situation? Yeah. Okay. And so I was feeling the burden of that and I was becoming really run down and tired. I was exhausted. It showed in everything about me. I couldn't hide it. And then I had baby number four in Ghana too. Hmm. So then I had four children and I was homeschooling and I was doing all these YouTube videos and I was doing a whole bunch of stuff and I was tired, I was really drained. And I just, I wasn't a person anymore. Hmm. Hmm. That's the only way that I can what describe do you mean by it. That? I was nothing. I was just a thing that existed. That's what I'd become. Hmm. I don't know how to explain that anymore. I was just a thing. You felt empty? Completely. I was working way too hard with no results. And... I knew that I needed more and I wanted more. But it was like I was just carrying this ball of chain, ball and chain, I was just dragging it along. And it, it, was, it, was, he it was a heavy weight. It was a heavy weight to carry. And I started to realise that this can't be life. Mm. This can't be life. I'm not, I'm not doing a service to my children. I want these things for my children and I can't give them these things. I can't live like this. Hmm. So if you look over your shoulder to your husband whilst you're trying, you're back in the corner trying to make a living, you know, get some money for your children and whatnot, take care of yourself. What was he doing? Would you remember, you know, him doing something to help? If he was, what was that? Nothing. Nothing. So what was he doing? Nothing. Nothing. Now, nothing is a very big umbrella. So can you give me details on, if you don't mind sharing, obviously, was it just sitting around, um, so, playing with friends? What is that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. His passion or his dream was always to do construction because when we left the, the UK, that was his field, it was construction, right? So he came here and he had these dreams of, you know, doing construction and, you know, yeah, doing construction, building houses for people, you know, all that kind of thing. That was his dream, but you can have a dream. If you don't apply action, nothing happens, mm. right? And so I had this YouTube channel where I began by just sharing my experience of having to, having moved to Ghana and the things that I was experiencing. And then, you know, I started documenting the journey of building the house and stuff like that. So we would get a lot of inquiries about, you know, oh, so you're, your partner does construction, maybe he can help me do this. So I was getting so many inquiries through, like it was, it was overwhelming. Like, sometimes I couldn't even respond to the messages. It was overwhelming because really, we were the first people doing it. But he just wasn't proactive enough in really grasping that. I don't want to go into too many details because I've shared it all in the book. And so I don't want to say too much, 
but nothing was happening. And I remember one day we had an argument <clears throat> about what he was doing. And he said to me, <clears throat> well, when you were having children, wasn't I the one working? Mm. Wasn't I the one making all the money? It's, I want to rest now. Hmm, really? He said that? Mm. Yeah. In Ghana? Yeah. Hmm. When you heard that, what ran to your mind? I think that was a defining moment for me. Because for me, that comment says a couple of things. First of all, it tells me that me looking after the children and raising them while you're at work doesn't mean anything. And secondly, that you're not about to change your situation because you're resting. So at that point, I knew that this is on me. And that was hard to deal with because I would look at other people. They were going out, they were exploring Ghana, they were doing things. I couldn't do anything. Because you couldn't afford. Couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And the person who could have helped didn't want to, didn't want to relax. How was your kids feeling? Were they eating good at that time? What was happening? It was hard. Mm -hmm. There are some stories I can tell, but it's too heartbreaking. <laughs> really. Just give us one, because I know most people, mm. one thing is you shared your experience in the book, mm. which I think is very unique. Not, not much people, like much people want, are willing to do that. Mm. Um, we yeah. like the glam of being married and engaged, mm. right? But the first statement in your book was, if it's in chi, like if you're yeah. looking at a forest from afar, you think it's together, it's very thick green. Mm. But the moment you get closer, you, you see that every tree is separated, yeah. right? So from afar, most people see marriages to be all this glamorous, everybody want to jump into it. Mm. But you telling your experience and showing you know, the details of it, that at one point you have to, have to fend for the whole family, having to take care of your own children, to a point where it might be hard, you know what I'm saying? Like, share it, it helps. Just one, I think that would you know, help a lot. Just one story. It's really hard to share these things because, as you said, right? The forest, mm -hmm. from afar, it looks mm -hmm. thick and healthy. You and said that, it's in your book. <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the book. I'm saying because you just repeated it, right? That is the only picture that people see. Mm. They've never come close to see what's really going on. And so when you then, after the, after the fact, start talking about these things that were not right, mm. people don't believe you. Mm. Because they saw the forest looks thick and healthy. Like, what do you mean? How can you say these things? That's not true. That's what happens. And so sometimes when I want to talk about the real of what happened, because I'm very real and very honest, right? All you get is backlash. She's lying. She's lying. She's lying. And so it's hard to then say what really happened. It makes it difficult to tell the story. You know, so that's why I'm struggling to give you one thing. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm tired of people telling me that I'm lying. So tell them, keep, keep, keep telling them to their sticks. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll give you this one story. Mm. I'm going to say this. Do not come for me. This is a true story. There was a time that we had run out of money, like for real run out of money, but we had done an investment, a property investment here. And I remember that day, I didn't have any money to feed my children. And I said, I said to my ex, we need to get some money because I have nothing right now. I'm not gonna ask anybody, that's too embarrassing. I'm not gonna do it. It's like, what are we going to do? It's like, I don't know. I was forced to go and, uh, I remember at the time, I hadn't given, I was heavily pregnant with baby number four. I was forced to go and ask one of his business partners for money. I remember um, he drove me to the mall, and he's, because that's where I was supposed to meet the person. He said, 
you get out and go and get the money because I'm not going to do it. I remember walking through a crumble to go and get this money. And I wanted to cry as I was doing the journey. <sighs> she got me crying on camera. <laughs> I remember crying or wanting to cry because my back was hurting. I was tired. I was like, oh, it must have been about seven or eight months pregnant. I had to go get this money and he wouldn't. He just stood, he stayed in the car and I had to go collect this money. It wasn't even much, it was like 3,000 cities or something wow. like that. And I had to go get it. And I was just, it broke me, you know? Hmm. It broke me that I didn't have someone who wanted the best for me and would do everything in his power to make my situation better. I had to be the one to do it. You know? I could tell you a hundred of those stories, but I'm not going to. Yeah, it's tough. I think I always said this, you're a very strong woman. And I don't know why I'm getting that message, but I really feel it. And you sharing this story where you have to, your husband decided not to go work. He is in his resting era. His wife is heavily pregnant. Mm. And he's like, look, I'm not gonna work. You can't force me. Mm. Whilst I was working, you were having babies. Now I'm resting now. Mm. But look, I have a friend who is my business partner in a mall waiting. Why don't you go ask him for money? Maybe mm. he can help you. That is very, it's tough. Okay. You understand? It's tough. And very. looking at what you've been able to do for yourself, looking back at that, I would, I'm like, what? How? How do you come out of this? Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And you sharing everything in a book. After reading this book, I'm not sure I'm going to get married. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But I think that's not your intentions, right? Yeah, You're not no, literally telling. Not. But look, other people are saying, they'll look at your situation and like, mm. you failed in life. Mm. You yeah. know, you failed. Mm -hmm. um, coming from the church community, mm. you're not allowed to even divorce, you're not allowed to, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. how do you feel even when people close to you, in your, own, your own family members look at you as a failure mm. because you let your marriage, your, your marriage go? Yeah, that was one of the first things a lot of people said to me, like, how can you quit? How can you do that? How can you walk away from that? They didn't know the story, <laughs> and that's simply because I never told anybody whilst I was going through these things, I kept it hidden. So when I came out to say all this stuff, it seems unbelievable because you've never had a hint of it from me before. Mm. And so people telling me that, oh, you failed, you failed, you failed. At first I did take that on board, I did. And I did, I, I used to say it to myself, like, man, you failed, you, you have failed. Like you're walking away from this thing and it's been 18 years, you've failed your children, Della. You've failed yourself, how can you do this? I had those moments, but there's one thing. I did this for my children mm. because I needed to better this situation and being a, in, a, in a household where things had become toxic was not for my children. Mm. Remember this one thing, right? Mm. I'm telling you my story. Don't forget, there's another story that has not been told yet. My children. Mm. Mm. So when I decided to come out of that and when I began to get strong I realized that I hadn't failed and I remember someone actually you said it to what? me I hadn't failed I remember someone said to me in fact I'll tell you it was it was Mooney he said to me you didn't fail you tried for 18 years and when he said that it was almost like he broke a shackle mm. Because I, I then started to look at my situation differently. I hadn't failed, I tried for so long. Because people ask me, if it was so bad, why didn't you leave so long ago? You could have left at any moment. Because I kept trying. I kept trying and trying and trying. And I was hitting my head against a wall. Mm. And it wasn't going to change. So either I accepted, I had to accept that, you know what? This is what my destiny is gonna be. Suck it up and live with it till the day that you die. Or change what you don't like. Hmm. And those are the only two options that I had. Hmm. And I knew what it had already done to me so far. I keep saying, I was going grey. 
I was going grey really far. If you go back to some of my early videos, I even said it in some of my videos, I was like, I'm going grey and I don't understand why. It was, I'm, I was making fun of it at the time, I was making light of it. I was like, I'm going grey really rapidly and I don't understand why I'm going grey. And people were like, oh, don't worry, just embrace the greys, 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 <laughs> grey is beautiful. But I didn't know that I was going grey because it was an underlying root. Because when I separated, I stopped going grey. Hmm. My greys remained that I had, but I, didn't, I stopped going grey. Greys were no longer coming. Interesting. So you were aging quickly yeah. because of the pressure, the stress, too and much. everything. It was too much. Way too much. In your book, you said something about advice for men and women. What is that advice? Tell us one. Um, mm. Someone heard you, sorry. Men, women. For me, I'm almost like, I'm not doing this marriage thing. <laughs> <laughs> no. But if we are still doing it, what, it, what are some of the things you should pay attention to going into marriage or some of the due diligence? Because you said that you can't really know somebody. Even in counseling, like you said, it's not deep enough. Yeah. Like really, what should we know before entering into kind of, you know, marriage? Yeah. So firstly, I want to say that I think marriage can be beautiful. I think long-term relationships can be beautiful if you've chosen the right person, right? There's no perfect person out there. You have to pick a person that you can work with, right? So there's going to be some things you like, some things you don't like. But I think before you head into any relationship, you have to understand yourself. That's the first one. It's not about the other person, it's about yourself. And that's why at the beginning of this interview, I spoke about myself. Because it wasn't even about him yet. It was about the things that were wrong with me first that I hadn't even admitted to myself. So my dad not being around. That impacted me hugely in ways that I didn't realize. I needed therapy and I didn't have it. So I went into a marriage with these things. And for most people, they go into marriage. I'm not saying you, you go into marriage without any baggage. That's, that's not possible. You have some baggage, but be aware of what your baggage is. And that's one of the things. So I think before you join yourself to someone, make sure that you're whole, make sure you understand what your issues are. But then you have to make sure you understand the other person too. You have to understand when things are tough, what that person is like, because that is where your issues are going to come out from. I say that you have to do a full circle with a person to really understand who that person is, right? Because happiness is easy to have. You can be happy. I can be happy for a year, two years, five years even. But really, when we hit, when we hit tough times, what comes out then? What, does your character change? What do you like? When you have no money, how do you behave? What kind of things do you do? Those are the things that you really need to, to focus on and look at. What is that person like? Are they gonna talk to you when you're in tough times? Because communication needs to be open. Things are not going well. You need to be able to communicate in order to overcome these boundaries. And if communication is not there, how do you overcome these boundaries together? Like you have to be willing to work on your relationship continuously it doesn't stop there's no such thing as reaching the peak of your marriage and everything is fine it's a daily choice you've picked this person it's a daily choice and I think both men and women have to look at themselves and you have to continuously choose this person because it's easy to think okay I'm going to be married to this person and then now my eyes start looking somewhere else I'm looking at someone else because everything seems greener on this side no 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 once you're married you're married to that person you work at it but that's only if it's a healthy relationship. If it's mm. toxic, mm. you need to get out. Mm. It is. I could feel it when you were telling me the story. Just every single story you told me about what you, you experienced with your ex, mm. every single one of them, you broke into tears. Mm. And uh, in my mind, I'm like, that's probably the one you could share. And that gets you to that point. What are the ones that you, you, you feel like you can't even share it here? That really breaks me. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a message, really, um, for people in general, yeah. about what you've been through, everything, what would that message be? I would say, live your life for you mm. and stop living for other people. Because often we go into things because we feel like it's what other people would expect of us. 
So what do you mean you're 30 and you're not married yet? Or you're 30 and you haven't had children yet? Why, why, why haven't you done things this way? This is how you're supposed to do it. You need to shut all of that off because I, I'm t I guarantee you, when it all hits the fan, they're not there. Mm. You're on your own to deal with this thing. Mm. No one is looking to help you at that point. You're gonna do it by yourself. So you might as well do what's right for you in the beginning. They can have their opinions. As someone said, opinions are like noses. Everybody has one, right? Do what is right for you because no one knows you. When you're crying at nighttime because something in your relationship has happened, when you're walking on eggshells every day, no one's there with you to experience what that loneliness is like, what your suffering is like. No one's there. So do what's right for you, what works for you. If you're not ready to get married till you're 40, so be it. If you don't want to get married, so be it. Do what's right for you because people will drop off and leave you. The ones that were championing you, saying, yes, do this, do this, you won't see them for dust. Mm. So that would be my advice. Do what works for you. Are you happy now? Yeah. Mm. I am. It's been a process though. Mm. It's been a tough, a tough journey to go on because I've had to be extremely honest to myself about my own wrongdoings. I'm not perfect. I'm not blameless. I did things wrong. I definitely did. My communication was terrible. I'm big on communication now. So the journey has been hard. Like I said, I've had to admit my faults to myself. I've had to work on myself. I've had to look at the ugly things about myself, but I've also had to admit to myself the things about me that are really good. And I've had to embrace that. I find it hard to compliment myself, but I compliment myself now. Mm. I have to, to be the person that I'm supposed to be. Really? But now I'm happy, mm. like genuinely, internal happy. I've not felt this happy in a long time. Mm. I say that I have to go back to 24 when I got married, and that's where I pick up. So you're 24 years old now? Yeah, I'm 24. You're very happy. Very happy. Do you know yourself now? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I've met a few women who did great things after they divorced, mm. almost like their life paused. Mm -hmm. and resumed after the divorce and went on doing amazing things. Yeah. There's a lot of women out there, mm -hmm. best belief, stuck in marriages they don't want to be in. Yeah. They don't have the courage like you did. They don't have the space to think because UK, US, you don't even have that time to really yeah. step out of yourself to assess your situation. Mm. They are stuck in it. You know, what would you say to people like that? Because you never know what you become if you break out of that. You know what I'm saying? Because mm. it's not healthy anyways. Yeah. Um, you're becoming less happy. Mm. People go to heavy depression and get hooked on drugs just so that they can cope with a relationship. Yeah, absolutely. That's 100% true. Mm. Those people are definitely out there because once I started telling my story, I've been contacted by so many people who were like, I can't believe you're talking about this thing. This is exactly what I'm going through. I'm in exactly your position. I've spoken to people who have even been in situations of like physical abuse and they don't know how to leave. And it's things like that that made me want to talk more because I realized that this is a huge problem. This is not a Della issue. This is a huge problem, especially within the African community where things are happening and we're not, talk, we're not talking about them because of how people are gonna respond to the things that we're saying and how we're gonna be looked at. For me, as my brother said, you're very stubborn. I am. <laughs> Trying to be stubborn for the right reasons now though. And because of that, I talk about these things more. So I always have to tell people that this is not about my story. I'm using my story as an example. I'm telling my story to help you, to give you strength, to know that you can do something for yourself after that. There is so much of you that you haven't even explored yet. There are things that you're supposed to do, you might not be able to do when you're in that relationship. And although it's scary coming out of that, and it's hard, you're gonna be, you. let me give you an analogy. Mm. When you wanna tidy up your bedroom, 
it gets a lot messier first before it gets tidy. And that's exactly the same thing that has to happen when you come out of a relationship. It's going to get really messy. Things are going to come out that you did not expect. But once you start dealing with things properly, you start to clean out all the mess and it gets better. And it does get better. Don't be fooled by people who are going to tell you, if you leave this thing, you're going to be worse off for it. Leave that alone, you don't need to hear that. Focus on the things that you want to do, the things that you've always wanted to do, the things that make you happy. For me, the things that made me happy going through my breakup, I love fragrance, I love to smell beautiful things. That helps me get through that difficult time. And from that, I've now birthed this, I'm a whole new person. If you knew me in the UK, you don't know me now. You don't know me, trust that. Mm. I'm a different person. I now embrace everything that there is to know about me. I'm extremely quirky and I'm okay with that. I'm not for everybody. I'm okay with that. I know who I am. You can't tell me, oh, Della's this way. I already know. I already know. I'm not saying all of it's good. Some of it I still need to work on, but I know who I am. And for those people that are stuck in those things, once you come out of it, you will learn some things about yourself you never knew. Some, you do things that you never dreamt that you would ever be able to do. If you have the courage to choose yourself, because that's what it is. You have to have the courage to choose yourself. Mm. You have to be brave. Mm. Mm. I like that. How do people buy the book? Before you yeah. do that, this is the cover of the book. It's you standing. <laughs> looks like a beach um, what was what was going through your, your mind standing there like that all alone yes what was going through your mind do you know this cover mm -hmm. represents a new beginning a new mm. start there's nothing around me it's just empty mm. and it's me I can't even see what's in front of me but I'm taking the step and that's what that pretty much represents mm. It's about starting and taking a journey that I know nothing about and being, doing it scared, doing it in the dark. Mm. That's what mm. it is. Guys, link in the description, um, pre-order, right? Yeah, so you can get it. Um, it's available on audio. It's available on Amazon, ebook, and you can also get printed copies as well on my mm. website. Mm. I like that. I mean, and thank you for sharing your story. It's not an easy one. Um, I know this conversation has been a therapeutic one. Yeah. I hope I didn't bring back too many bad memories. No, no. I don't, it's hard to bring those memories back sometimes, but I don't do it for me. I do it for the people that are going to benefit from it mm. because I know what it's like to be in, have come from such a dark place where you feel so isolated. And I never want anyone to feel like that. So that's also why I started the relationship wellness coaching as well, because I want to be able to help women and men that are going through the same thing because one of the hardest things about going through these things is that thing of loneliness and although you can have friends around you, if they haven't been through it, they can't relate to you. You need someone who can relate to the journey that you're about to go on because it's a really lonely journey. I've spent many nights going to bed crying. Mm -hmm. I don't want someone else to feel like that, feel like they're alone. Mm. And that's how that was birthed. Mm. So people can even reach out to you. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. I do consultations. I help in any any way that I can, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm okay. available for that. Okay. She she has a YouTube channel, More to Della. Um, the beginning of the story is there. Everything is there. You can literally go back to the first time they moved to Ghana mm. um, to watch her journey. Um, what went wrong? Link in the description also on the screen to buy a book, everything is down there. Reach out to her. You know, you, you might be going through the same thing you know, she went through. Feel free to reach out to have a conversation. It's very therapeutic. Sometimes you get someone to understand exactly what you're going through if they've you know, lived in your same you know, experience with you. Um, if you have, let me put it this way. What do you think you wish I could have asked that I didn't ask you? Mm. Um, what would I do differently? What would you do differently? Okay. Yeah. Answer that. I think going back mm. to 24, I would not have got married. I would have dated 
some more mm. to see what else was out there. My mind wasn't opened enough to the different things that I needed. Because going into a relationship, there are things that you need. Sometimes you don't know what you need. I needed someone who would be able to provide for me. I needed to feel special in some ways. I needed to feel like a woman. I never felt those things. Mm. And so if I could go back, I would look for that person that could provide those things for me and also know what I could also provide to the other person. So that when we enter the relationship, we enter from a healthy perspective, knowing what the other person needs, what we need from each other. Because often we don't know, or we don't admit that we need these things. And that can sometimes be the downfall. Hmm. So that's what I would do differently. Hmm. I wouldn't get married at 24. I would wait until I was about 30, at least. Hmm. 30? Yeah. yeah, I would. What about the naysayers saying that women have a time limits or whatever they call it yeah your um body clock right yeah, yeah i think if you're gonna use that as a reason to join yourself to domestic abuse or violence i mean that's your choice i don't think that's a healthy choice to do i think that when you reach 30 i don't think that means you can't have children anymore i mean i got married at 24 i had my first child when i was 29 anyway so I don't think that that should be. I think it's better for you to engage in a relationship that is healthy so that you know you're bringing your children into something healthy rather than allowing your children to be in something toxic. What's the point of having children if you're going to do them a disservice anyway? I think you can wait a few years. You can get married at 30. You can have children in five years' time or three years' time or whatever. But it's a healthy situation. Make sure your situation is healthy. Don't bring children into an unhealthy situation because you're going to have to get them therapy too. Mm. Thank you so much for talking to me. That's all right. I've really enjoyed it, actually. I, you have? Yeah, I, I really was looking forward to this discussion with you because I felt like I could be honest with you and I knew you were going to ask me some deep questions. So. I, hope I, asked, <laughs> I hope I asked all the right questions. You did, you did, you did. Thank you so you much. Did. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate That's it. That's good. So where we are currently filming is called Gender Place. Gender Place is a co-working space. Um, Located here in East Legon, very close to American House. You are a diaspora, you work remotely, you want somewhere to plug and play. They do have a high speed internet here. They also have a restaurant, so you can be working and then you know, ordering some food or bring it you know, to your desk or whatever, eat, have a good time. They have a podcast studio where you're a content creator, you want to be able to you know, come here and just create content without having to have a camera, a microphone. I mean, all those you know, things. You know, come check it out, link in the description. Tell them you are coming from Web Nation Africa, you might get a discount. If it's your first time here, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Comment down below about what you enjoyed about this episode. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's say bye-bye to the people watching. Yes. Peace.